Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 2nd, 2009, and my guest is Judge Richard Posner, federal judge, senior lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School, and a prolific author. His latest book is the subject of today's podcast, A Failure of Capitalism, The Crisis of 08, and The Descent into Depression. Judge Posner, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Uh, you indict capitalism for the crisis, uh, and you wrote your book – it came out, I think, in May of this year. It was a very um, ambitious book to get it out so quickly, which you managed to do, uh, and you forecast the worsening of things at, at the time. So feel free to add any of those uh, worsenings uh, along, along the way in our conversation. But what is, what is the source of the problem in your opinion? I wouldn't say that I had indicted capitalism. I mean, it did call, cause, call the book a failure of capital. I think it is a failure. But it's a failure from, uh, it's a failure primarily of uh, the governmental institutions of capitalism, uh, the central bank, you know, the Federal Reserve, and the uh, regulatory system for uh, controlling financial uh, business. Now, you need that. Uh, as I argue in the book, um, banking is an inherently uh, risky business, and so you have to have regulatory controls, and you have to have a central bank that controls the, um, you know, the money supply and interest rates and so on. And that's all part of the capitalist system. It's not just markets; it's a, it's a regulatory structure, governmental structure, property rights, the central bank. You know, that's all part of the capitalist system. What? Totalitarian systems and socialist systems actually don't. They have worse problems, but they don't have this particular problem of a banking system that can uh, go awry. But the real problem, what, what I think, if you, had, if you wanted to identify one problem, it would be unsound monetary policy by the Federal Reserve System in the early 2000s. Cheap credit. Uh, too much, too yeah, much pu- money. Yeah, pushed, uh, uh, flooded the economy with money. Uh, interest rates fell very dramatically. Um, the Federal Reserve was fooled by the fact that there wasn't much inflation in the sense of what is measured by the consumer price index, but in fact there was uh, inflation. It was inflation, particularly of houses, but of other real estate and also of. Uh, Stock in the stock market, and um, when you have that, it, you have the infl- uh, asset price inflation, particularly in housing, um, you create a great danger for the economy because houses are the products that are bought with debt. You know, like an eighty percent mortgage, ninety percent mortgage, sometimes a hundred percent mortgage. So that means when you have a housing boom, the banking system becomes very heavily involved in housing because it's financing the boom. And if the boom turns out to be, you know, an inflationary phenomenon, a bubble, and bursts, and there's a tremendous dive in housing prices, then, you know, you can you can bankrupt the whole banking industry because it's so heavily invested in housing. And that's that's essentially that's that's essentially what happened. Now, what reinforced the problem was that the regulation of the banking system, which is very uh, fragmented in the United States, was just not up to the task of uh, identifying these risks, these phenomena. <clears throat> the Federal Reserve and the Securities Exchange Commission and so on, they just didn't realize that there was a uh, uh, a risk of a, of a housing bubble that might burst. And they didn't realize, which is really remarkable, that over the last several decades, there's grown up a large uh, banking industry, usually referred to as a shadow banking industry, of 
companies that that do what is functionally banking, but they're not regulated as banks. Now, and they're the broker dealers, companies like Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. They've all disappeared in one way or the other, become absorbed in other firms. But they were, you know, doing. They were, you know, borrowing their capital and and lending it, which is what banks do. <clears throat> but they weren't regulated as banks. They didn't have federal deposit insurance. Um, they were regulated by the SEC, which was very, very lax and doesn't understand banking. <clears throat> and uh, so there was a, a, a great regulatory gap, which um, co- you know, which interacted with the very low interest rates, which were pushing the banks into more and more housing financing. And so you have unsound monetary policy by the Federal Reserve. You have a regula- lax regulation, what I call regulatory inattention. <clears throat> and finally, you have a very complacent economics profession, which was lulling everybody to sleep by saying that, you know, never going to be another depression, that if you have a recession, Federal Reserve uh, can cure it <laughs> more or less painlessly. It just lowers interest rates, which stimulates economic activity. So, and that turned out, of course, last fall, that that didn't work. So, Well, I share some of your um, disdain for the profession, and and we can come back to that later, but I want to focus on the regulatory inattention. Um, You, in the book, make a very uh, forceful argument against people who claim that investors were irrational or myopic, and yet you seem willing to put that picture on regulators, as you point out in the book, starting around 2002, pretty early, 2003, it got louder, 2004, there were increasing voices talking about the nature of housing prices being unsustainable. Why are you comfortable claiming that regulators were inattentive and that that was the source of the problem? In particular, why won't you blame the people who finance those investments? Uh, I don't blame them, but it seems like you should have to. It wasn't regulatory inattention. It seems like it was simply excessive risk taking by by capitalists who you want to portray as rational. What's your? How do you square oh, I don't that? Think I don't think their risk taking was excessive, ex ante. That is, um, if you're a, if you're a uh, a financier in 2003, 4, 5, 6 even, you see that um, uh, there's tremendous demand for loans, for houses, that um, uh, it's very profitable because interest rates are so low that you can borrow very, very cheaply in order to meet this huge demand. And, um, and now you know that, of course, there's a risk. There's always a risk. Um, there's always a risk that it, it, you know, there could be a big dive in housing prices. Then you're broke. There's always a risk of that. But um, uh, all businessmen are taking a bankruptcy risk, and the question is whether it's excessive in relation to, you know, how much profit they're making and so on. So they're being told by the Federal Reserve and by the economists. There's no housing bubble, you know. Housing prices are rising because of fundamental factors of supply and demand. They're going to continue to rise. So housing is a good investment. And I, I say these businessmen knew they it could be wrong. They're taking a lot of measures like these, you know, securitized debt uh, instruments to try to minimize risk. Um, but they know there's a risk, but... You know, as I say, you can't be in business without taking the risk of bankruptcy. The problem is that what's the risk of bankruptcy for an individual bank or individual broker-dealer can, through this, you know, chain reaction effect that we saw last fall, this can bring down the whole economy. That's where the regulators come in. They, Their responsibility is to, is, is to you know, say to these banks, look, you're taking risks which are rational in terms of your goals, but you're creating a risk that you don't really care about because it's not a risk to your shareholders. It's a risk to the economy, to the global economy. That's what businessmen worry about. So that's what you have regulation for. And businessmen, 
if businessmen thought it was their job not to take risks that would endanger the global economy, then you wouldn't need regulation. But the businessmen just worry about, you know, risks to their company. Am I making enough money for my shareholders and for myself that I can, you know, take these risks, make these very risky loans? They're very, very profitable. They're very risky. You balance the two, and you decide it's a rational way to go. That's fine. That's what business... It's like pollution, right? We don't expect businessmen to worry about pollution because the pollution affects, you know, other people. It doesn't affect their business. It doesn't affect their consumers. It affects, you know, maybe people a thousand miles away who are breathing the acid rain caused by an electric utility. Electric utility doesn't worry about that. It's not its business. Business is profit maximization, not environmental protection. So you have to have regulation. It's the same with these banks. Their business isn't systemic risks, global economy, depressions. That's not their business. Their business is profit maximization. And that means they'll take risks as long as they're they're being paid, you know, more than the expected cost of the risk. No, but the puzzle is, as you point out, there there is an externality. Right. But uh in the case of the pollution, uh, all the costs are borne by people downwind, right? And the firm itself can avoid those costs and just profit from the production. In the case of financial institutions, uh, they were wiped – many of them were, were wiped out or should have been. But you don't – you're not mentioning the moral hazard problem, the fact that if you thought you might be bailed out, you not only had an incentive to ignore – your externality, you had an incentive to increase it. Well, sure, but that's no different from pollution. <laughs> if you're paid to pollute, you're going to pollute more, right? Right. Or if you, or if you, I mean, suppose suppose you have pollution, it actually does affect your own workers. But then the government right. says to you, well, okay, we'll pay their medical costs. You don't have to worry about that, right? So you're going to do it. I don't, I don't see what the difference is. Well, again, the question is when you said, it's rational and profitable to, to make risky investments. It's always a question of the trade-off. And the more we insulate uh, investment banks and, and commercial banks from the downside risk, then the more risky the, – the more attractive a risky bet will be. Sure, but that's a regulatory failure, right? <laughs> it's if a different you tell kind. Banks, if it's you a... tell banks, yeah, do whatever you want. We'll bail you out. Of course, they're going to take, they're going to take more risk. That's perfectly rational. They're, Whatever environment the government creates, the the business business uh, men will adapt to that environment, and whatever profit opportunities the environment creates could be government contracts for things that government doesn't really need. Right? Yeah. Whatever it is, the businessmen will adapt. And they'll they'll be acting entirely rationally. That doesn't mean they won't make mistakes. Obviously, everyone makes mistakes. They'll make mistakes. But they're they're you know, as I say they're adjusting to to the environment. The responsibility for creating the environment is the government's responsibility, which it which it failed to uh, uh, discharge. But you're lumping together two types of regulatory failure. One kind is that we weren't we didn't regulate them enough. We we let them take risks, ignoring the externality. The other is. We encourage that those risks by bad regulations. There's a big difference between those two causes, both in historical valuation and preventing it in the future. I don't think there's. A, I don't see the difference. No. Right? I mean, stupid regu- You can have stupid regulation because it's terribly lax, or you can have stupid regulation because it actually, you know, subsidizes uh, foolish activities. Right. So that's the problem with the. You know, the Community Reinvestment Act and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they contributed to, I don't think they contributed critically the way a lot of conservative critics do. I don't, I don't think it was a critical fit. But there's no question that the Community Reinvestment Act, you know, 1977, then it strengthened during the Clinton administration and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which borrowed very cheap or until they fell, <laughs> until they collapsed, but they borrowed very That's right. Low rates because they were assumed to have a kind of informal backing by the government, as they did, and then they uh, 
made a lot of money and so on. And they encouraged, you know, subprime mortgages, no question about it. So that's that's an example of regulatory encouragement of stupid behavior. Right. <laughs> and the and and the other is the failure to uh, control the externalities that a private behavior can create. I, I don't think they're they're I don't think they're they're significantly they're, they're both regulatory failures. I don't think one is, you know, more culpable than than the other. Well, then going forward, do you have a um a set of uh, prescriptions based on those uh those failures or do you think in terms well, of remaking um, the financial system? Well, I I don't uh I I think if if I'm correct that the that the basic problems were unsound monetary policy, um, regulatory inattention, regulatory laxity, and uh, complacency on the part of the economics profession, they're all actually to a considerable extent self-correcting, right? So you know, there's there's a an economist, very prominent monetary economist at Stanford named John Taylor. And Taylor had devised a rule for by a very simple rule for what the uh Federal Reserve should what level it should set the interest rate that it regulates, the federal fund rate. It sets an interest rate which influences other interest rates. That's its basic way in which it controls interest rates. And you know, and they're supposed to supposed to look at a few factors, and Taylor observed that in the early 2000s, 2000s, the Federal Reserve was greatly deviating from from his rule. His rule said they should have a federal funds rate of I don't know two percent or something, three percent. They pushed it down to. Now he wanted it to be rising. Zero. He wanted it to be rising. They held it at one percent, I think, for about yeah, two, three and years. Yeah, and actually. It was actually a, a negative rate because there was in some, some inflation, some of the regular CPI inflation. So, um, so yeah, so so you know, the Federal Reserve should pay more attention to the Taylor Rule. You don't need a new institution; you just need a reminder that they, you know, that they've got to worry about bubbles, and they, and you know, they have they have to be smarter. Now, having gone through this experience, obviously, you know, they're alert to this problem. And similarly, with the regulatory laxity, so in the case of the commercial banks, you know, like Wachovia and Citigroup, um, the Federal Reserve and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the control of the currency and all the state banking commissions, they have all the powers they need. They can do anything to these banks. So all they have to do is, you know, be more alert and say, look, you know, um, what is this thing <laughs> you're calling a mortgage-backed security? What is this? We haven't seen it before. And you're creating these, you know, off-balance sheet liabilities. You're issuing all these credit default swaps. What's this about? They just have to be more alert. And... um now maybe we can't trust them to be more alert. Maybe they're not paid enough, and so on. So uh, Paul Volcker, you know, for, very distinguished former chairman of the Federal Reserve, he suggested that uh, 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 banks should not be allowed to engage in, in risky conduct. They shouldn't be allowed to be affiliated with, you know, or have divisions that engage in proprietary trading, which is very, very risky, obviously. So that's that would be a structural reform. I think there's a lot of merit to that'd be complicated, but I think it's something worth considering. There is a concern about as you say, these off balance liabilities. A lot of these banks and broker dealers they'd create these special investment vehicles in which to park <laughs> their risky assets and not show it on their balance sheets. And similarly, a lot of these derivatives that they trade and these uh, credit default swaps is a type of derivative which of which there are many trillions floating around in the world economy. Um, they're off balance sheet contingent liabilities, and so it's hard for the examiners, the bank examiners, to figure out what the real financial situation of a bank is. So you know, th- so 
maybe those all those liabilities should be somehow put onto the balance sheet. So there are a lot of you know little things that can be done. I, I don't see any need or any benefit from elaborate structural reorganization. Um, but in, I mean, so the focus argument I think is right is. If the commercial banking industry is insulated from this high risk type of financial activity, then if if the if the high risk people go bust again, well at least you have a safe commercial banking industry as a kind of backbone of global finance to fall back on, and that would that would soften the blow from the collapse of these uh, fancy. Uh, I- I don't know if that would work. High risk traders. I don't know if that would work. There won't they won't be much of a backbone of the global financial system if they're not doing anything that's terribly risky. I think the crucial question is is what kind of shadow banking system do we want? What kind of institutions uh that used to be called investment banks, I think will be called that again when it's not profitable for them to to be what they are. They'll go back to their old their old names. They're already doing their old the same stuff. They just have access to the Federal Reserve discount window, which is very convenient for them. But to me, the crucial question is uh, if we don't uh, get rid of too big to fail, it can be very difficult to be confident that uh, that those banks lack with any um, any prudence. Do you think that's a, an issue? Do you think um, that the bailout of those banks reinforced uh, the risk-taking that I think is the source of the problem? Well, there's no question that if you have um, if you have an implied promise to save these companies because of their either their size or just the fact they're somehow critically interconnected with the rest of the financial economy, the way Lehman Brothers was. Lehman Brothers wasn't wasn't so huge, but if they're in a position to cause a chain reaction of failures throughout the financial uh, sector. Yes, then you have to <clears throat> you have you have to uh, uh, you have to worry about that. Now, what's happened is that as a result of the events of last fall, the uh, the big the big five um, invest which you call investment banks, which is fine thing to call them, the big five all vanished. <clears throat> so Lehman Brothers went broke. Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch were acquired by banks, and Goldman and uh, Morgan Stanley converted. J.P. Morgan, J. P. Morgan Chase, I think. So that's a real bank. Oh, yeah, that's Morgan right. Stanley. They're a real, yeah, that's a real quote, bank. real bank. But Morgan yeah. Stanley and Goldman Sachs converted to bank holding companies. So as a result, um, all these things are now, except of course Lehman is dead, but the other four, they're all regulated now by the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve has the major shadow banks or investment banks under its wing. Now, so, so that problem for the present, and again, once, once, you're, once you're under the Federal Reserve's regulatory control, their examiners have complete power over you. Now, the problem is that, apart from the many hedge funds and the insurance companies on, that aren't uh, under the Federal Reserve and yet have vast financial resources and take a lot of risks. Apart from that, um, in the years to come, you know, there'll be uh, there'll be all sorts of new financial institutions, new fin- new investment banks, and so on. So the question is what to do. They will uh, fall automatically under the regulatory uh, control of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, the Securities and Exchange, Exchange Commission historically has had no interest in uh, solvency regulation. It's really just done investor protection. But now, you know, <laughs> having the huge failure last fall, um, it's it's trying to. It has a new, I think, a good new director, a chairman, and it's, you know, it's trying to um, create a uh, a culture and procedures and expertise and so on to control the systemic risk that a large investment bank can pose. So I'm not sure we can do much more beyond that. Going back to the underlying or 
proximate causes of the crisis. And then I want, let, want to talk about this for another few minutes and we'll move on to the escaping from the mess we're in, uh, at least in the short run. Going back to the proximate causes, you correctly point out that that leverage was a huge part of it. And you and you mentioned earlier in the conversation that uh, when housing loans are t- requiring 20 percent down, there's not much of a problem. Uh, what role did that play, the the erosion of that standard in the mass? Seems to me it's um, it's pretty decisive. The question then is why did it erode? You're not going to blame uh, irrationality or or irrational exuberance, I don't think. So, what is your explanation for why uh, lenders got so uh, careless in requiring skin in the game? Uh, well, see, if if house prices if if house prices are rising, um, uh, there's no reason to um, be as uh, cautious in in lending, right? Because if you think house prices are going to rise, say, say you're confident that they're going to rise at a rate of five percent a year, and that means that if you lend a person a 100% mortgage, in four years, he'll have a 20% equity, right? His, price will be, his mortgage will be the same, but right. it, the price will be higher. So that's, that's the basic thinking. Um, when prices are rising in real estate markets, you have very uh, low default rate because if someone gets into trouble... He doesn't abandon the house or, you know, have it foreclosed on. It doesn't make any sense. He just sells it. So uh, house prices had been rising for a long time in the United States and in the 90s, and they kept rising. And as I say, the experts, the Fed, Bernanke himself, and, you know, distinguished economists and so on said, yeah, no, this is this is permanent. This is, you know, rising population and restrictions by local zoning authorities are reducing the amount of land available for building new houses and so on so this is this is you know going to be an uh, indefinite uh price increase well you know if that's what you think and now there are there were people warning against this saying this is baloney right but the majority view the, the consensus view really was no this is very healthy market and you so both private people, I mean, you know, consumers, they want to get in on this thing. They want to have a house or another house or two houses or what have you. Yep. And the bankers cater to this uh, because it's very profitable. So, you know, you have you have Greenspan, this icon of fiscal rectitude, saying in the early 2000s that he thought people should be getting adjustable rate mortgages. Uh, well, that's ridic- well, that's risky, right? Adjustable yep. rate mortgage obviously is risky, <laughs> especially <laughs> when the if, rates are if artificially Greenspan low. Greenspan is telling yeah. you to get an adjustable risk mortgage. What are, what are you supposed to do? So that's why I say that's why I say this is the government uh, the government failure. But the next question would be, and I think this is one of the crucial questions of the of the crisis, and will be one of the historical. Uh, debates that we will be hearing for a long time. You gave the example of 5%. In many of these markets, the bottom tier, not just the average price, the bottom third of housing in various cities was rising at double-digit rates uh, starting in the uh, mid to late 1990s, well before Greenspan in 2002 was holding interest rates low. And the Irrational exuberance crowd, the animal spirits uh, folks of which your book has some of the flavor, were saying, well, people just decided prices were going up. Uh, but you reject that argument in the book, at least as a, I think, the, the mania of crowds kind of argument. So what is your explanation for why that price appre- appreciation was going on, given that the fundamentals turned out not to be true? Well, I... I- I believe I believe in bubbles, but I don't think buying in a bubble is irrational. I mean, it's ex post, of course, could be. Say it's stupid, but Depends. no. I mean, prices are going up, and and you think, well, maybe it's a bubble. On the other hand, I don't know when the bubble is going to end. 
Um, well, what gets it started? Oh, what gets it started is the is the low interest rates, right? I mean, the big the big expense in buying a house, or a big very big expense in buying a house, is the mortgage. So if interest rates go down, that makes a, a house much more affordable to people. And uh, so so they buy, and because because demand is increasing and the supply can can increase fast enough. Um, you have rising prices. At some point, it becomes self-sustaining because the prices kept rising even after mortgage prices began, mortgage rates uh, arose. Because um, because you see prices are going up and you say to yourself, well, they're going up. Other people think that, uh, this, that you know, the prices are going to continue to rise. I want. I don't want to miss out. I, like I mean, all that. this is just universal. You know, as soon as the stock market started rising, I guess in uh, in April, and you read the newspapers and you have all these uh, ex- so-called experts saying, "Well, you know, time to t- time to get on the bandwagon. You're going to feel bad if you're if you if, if you don't buy now because prices are rising." <laughs> I call that rational exuberance. I'm sure it's not my – I didn't coin it, but obviously a, a rational, cautious person can profit from a bubble in the middle right, if he gets exactly. out soon enough. But you still need an explanation for why it gets started, and the timing doesn't work uh, for the interest rate story. The, the bubble starts expanding in the late 1990s, not in the two, early 2000s. But, it, but the rate of increase was greater in the 2000s. I'm not so sure. It's uh, pretty healthy all the way through in some market. It depends on the market, of course. It, it's it's actually quite interesting how varied the market experience was. In some cities, there was very little appreciation and very little collapse. In other cities, in other cities, there was an enormous appreciation in the early 1990s. I, I think the story is yet to be told what role government policy played. But it doesn't matter because, look, even if, even if uh, zero interest rates in the 2000s didn't have an effect, which is hard to believe. Oh, I think it did. But even if it didn't, the Federal Reserve, if it, if it had spotted the bubble, could have burst it by raising interest rates, right? Yeah. And that's what it failed. That's the great failure. It's not the way your, um, your book is being received. So uh, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, your book's being received as a sort of uh, a recanting of, of Chicago free market economics. But well, you don't it think is that... to an extent because the uh, because what I call the complacency of the of the profession was the belief that um, that Greenspan, you know, the the great free market guy, the Ayn Rand. <laughs> disciple all that nonsense. Yes, ridiculous. that he had squared the circle, right? Yep. That he had that by by low interest rate policy, uh, he w- he had stimulated the economy, but had managed to avoid Not inflation. Too much. Yeah. That's a that's a tremendous error that he made. I mean, it's a colossal error, and it is due in part to this uh, overconfidence in. Um, uh, and you know, kind of conservative economic policy, in which you let you know it's not even good economics because because even Chicago economists understand there's such a thing as externality. So you can't just say, well, of course, the, and which is what Greenspan did say, that well, you know, these bankers they're very intelligent and so on. They clearly uh, are, are not going to take excessive risks. Well, of course they'll take if there's enough money in it. <laughs> they'll take risks which are excessive from the from the from the overall uh, economy's standpoint. You know, right? Get back to my point. Perfectly rational. If you're making a huge amount of money from risky activity, it makes perfectly good sense to continue with the risky activity, even if you, that you know that maybe there's like a one percent chance. Of of going of that you'll go broke, especially if you have you know golden parachutes and all the, you know severance pay and all this stuff, makes perfectly good sense. And for the government to think and w- that what makes perfectly good sense for the bankers makes perfectly good sense for the economy as a whole. That's a tremendous mistake. Well, I agree with that, um, but I I don't want to go 
back to the too big to fail thing, but I do think that had something to do with it. But I want to pick up something you said earlier. I, I think it's a bit unfair to Milton Friedman, who's gone and can't uh, defend himself, to imply, I know you didn't say this literally, but to imply that there was something Chicago economic uh, about trusting in Greenspan's discretionary ability to fine-tune the economy, right? I mean, Milton Friedman's career really was a uh, – about half of it was a monument to the um, dangers of Fed discretion. And uh, so I, I don't – I can't – I don't think you can lay that that failure at, at certainly the uh, the modern father of well, Chicago economics. But, well, I think you can actually because – uh, <laughs> Oh, I think you can. For one thing – uh, he he has always argued that, or, you know, his big book with Anna Schwartz. So he argued that um, the depression, the 1929 depression, or the, I'm sorry, the, the Great Depression that began in 1929, that would have been just a recession if it hadn't been for unsound uh, monetary policy by the Federal Reserve. And that's a theory, it's possible. And the implications of it, which were picked up, you know, by people like uh, Bernanke and uh, Greenspan, is that uh, all you have to do to avoid, you know, real economic trouble is that uh, uh, when the economy slows down, you want to make sure that you don't reduce the money supply. That, that's the accusation against the Federal Reserve in, in 1930, maybe, maybe. I think 30 and 31. That's right. Want to make sure they keep everything loose, and so that that is that is. But of course, what happened last fall, September, when the uh, when the financial collapse occurred, uh, monetary policy proved to be totally ineffectual, right? Because the Federal Reserve had begun reducing interest rates in 2008 because it was obvious by the beginning of 2008 that there was a problem no one no one knew how serious it was but there was a, but everyone knew there was a problem so it pushes interest rates down and right after you know September 15th when Lehman Brothers collapsed it pushed it way down eventually it's been pushed down to zero <laughs> with no effect why do you say no effect because and, and the only the effect is that the banks now have one trillion dollars in cash. Well, that's true, but which part is not of that, doing anybody any good. I agree with that. Part of the reason that's is that's what you get when you have look when you have when when you when you force down the federal funds rate. What you get is you get uh, unlimited cash reserves for banks. What you don't get necessarily is lending. That's correct. <laughs> that's the great mistake. Well, I'm right? not. That's, I, the great, that's the great Friedman mistake. I disagree. You can have very <laughs> low interest rates and no lending. Well, I, I I disagree partly because you know I feel like someone's got to defend Milton when he can't defend himself. Uh, true, I do agree with you that there's not much lending going on. I wouldn't say there's zero. I would agree with you though that banks are holding excess reserves. <laughs> Part of the reason is that they're being paid, as Scott Sumner said last uh, – I think it'll turn out to have been last week in our in our schedule. Uh, the banks were paid to hold those reserves. Interest was offered on those, on those reserves in October of 2008. So the Fed, for reasons somewhat mysterious, decided to mitigate the impact of that. But more no, importantly – No, it's not mysterious. The reason there – the reason the, – the, 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 the fix the Fed has gotten itself in is – if the federal reserve rate if the if the uh, federal funds rate is zero no bank will lend to any other bank because because that's the, that's the interbank lending you know secured interbank overnight lending rate if the if it's zero interest no no one will lend to another bank we don't care about that what we care no, about no no we do care no, critically we'll, about that because wow. banks need to be able to borrow reserves in order to make loans Ooh. so so the fear was that that the interbank interbank lending would completely close, and that's why uh, by paying uh, by by paying interest rate on the reserves, the uh, the um, the government encourages the banks to hold on to reserves so they can do some lending. See, the problem would be that if 
if you couldn't make any money lending because you had zero interest rate, you would just – well, you obviously wouldn't lend. you just buy treasury bills or yeah, something but like you that. don't just lend to each other. You lend to, real, to businesses. The issue isn't whether they lend to each other. The issue – that's part – I mean that's relevant. But the crit- critical question is would they lend to new businesses, expansion of businesses? And of course, they're worried about the future, so there's anxiety. So I certainly accept the, the, the fact that, that banks were being more cautious than they normally would have been, and they should be more cautious because there's a lot of uncertainty about what's coming. But just two, two things I think are important. One is it didn't go to zero. It's a quarter of a percent. That's the first thing. Second thing, much more importantly for Milton's legacy, is that Milton Friedman never advocated the federal funds rate. No, but he advocated really – he advocated things that don't make any sense at all in my opinion. Like? Like deflation. <clears throat> he thought the, he thought the, uh, he thought the Federal Reserve should um, – should reduce the money supply uh, every year by a by a fixed percentage, like one percent. And it was ingenious, but you know, real kind of academic uh, moon gazing. The, the, <laughs> the notion was that that uh, because because you don't earn interest by holding cash, you hold a suboptimal amount of cash. That is, when you're deciding whether to hold cash or buy a security of some sort, you 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 disfavor holding cash because you're not getting any interest on it. So, but if you have deflation, then the rate of deflation is the equivalent of an interest rate for holding cash, right? If you yeah. if you right, okay. So that was his idea. Now, I mean, we would be in. I mean, that, that's just utterly unworkable. And then his other Why? idea... Why? Which, that, that was an idea. ...had but, deflation every year, and people go crazy, right? Well, if it think? were expected, it wouldn't be a big deal. It would be a any tremendous more, more than deal. A one, it would be chaos. I don't agree, but go ahead. It would be chaos. But more importantly, that but isn't... his more that wasn't important his... idea was that instead of having the Federal Reserve, you would have simply a fixed rate at which the money supply would expand every yeah, year. Yeah, that, that's his, that was his more common. Well, proposal. the problem with now it, it's not an entirely bad idea, and if we had had that, we mightn't have had this uh, depression, recession, whatever you want to call it. But the problem is that if you, if the economy does get into trouble, and you don't have a central bank, you just have an automatic rule of expanding the money supply, then you then, then then you can be in really serious trouble because then you have no flexibility to uh, you know deal with an emergency there's no way in which you can save banks if you can't create money to give them i guess the crucial question is whether most emergencies are the caused by that flexibility or from other causes but um yeah but i mean it's crazy to say you're going to eliminate the central banks so you have no governmental control over the money supply it's just going to grow automatically you know, it's like planes without pilots and so on. If you really trust your machinery, <laughs> yeah, you'll do that. But but most people say, no, you want to have some discretion somewhere because of all the uncertainties in, in the world. Well, it depends on how much you trust the pilots. But l- let's, move on to, let's move on to a different question, which is the um, – you wrote a recent article, a very um, – really beautiful article on Keynes. And you went back and you you read the general you read the general theory, and you wrote a summary of it. And uh, I think it's probably the best summary of Keynes ever written. I don't know if Keynes would have understood it. Uh, there's a lot of <laughs> debate as to what Keynes really meant, right. and it's kind of an irrelevant um, exercise. Keynes has come to mean a certain set of things, which are convoluted enough. But your article really um, did a very nice job in in creating at least a coherent. Uh, version of of what Keynes might have meant, and I, I still am troubled by it. So I wanted to get your first thoughts on it, and then uh, ask you a question or two about it. Uh, particularly the idea of government stimulus as a way to get out of the mess, at least in the short term. So, you're are you in favor of that, and on what grounds? Well, I'm in favor of the principle, but I'm beginning to wonder about the <laughs> the execution. So. So the the simplest way to 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 think about it is that if we suppose we have a situation in which 
people are afraid, banks are afraid, and as a result, there's just a tremendous amount of hoarding. So you have the banks, you know, with their trillion dollars in cash. Uh, the amount of uh, currency in circulation, well, I'm not sure it's actually in circulation, the amount of currency in the economy has increased a great deal. A lot of people actually, you know, the, the sale of safes has, has uh has boomed. I'm not surprised. People are keeping a you know they're scared. They're keeping a lot of cash in, in their in their house, and the banks are hoarding. And there was just an article in the uh, New York Times business section this morning that the amount of cash held by non financial businesses has increased substantially. So there's this tremendous hoarding. And apart from the cash, there's also um, you know a lot of say uh, the personal savings rate has increased. And a lot of that is going into, you know, bank accounts and all sorts of safe uh, Reasonably uh, places. So. And so the argument is that money is not being used uh, in the economy, really. It's not being used to buy things or to invest or anything, just sitting there inert. And that the government if it can borrow it and put it to work, you know, on public projects of various sort. That's that's the theory that, that and and so you're just gonna substitute public demand for uh, a terribly impaired and fearful private demand and that people will be happy to lend to the government because the government uh, is isn't going to default. So so that's the theory and it's a perfectly good theory. The problem is that uh number one, um, the tendency is to institute this these programs too late, right? So this this uh, $787 billion stimulus should have been um, enacted last fall. Instead, it didn't get enacted until February 20th. And now, uh, and then it turns out that because of our governmental red tape and because of politics and everything, uh, it moves very, very slowly the the implementation is very slow, and also many of the expenditures are really stupid, and they don't do anything. They're political. But, I mean, you want to you want to use the money to uh, to you know to put people to work. You don't want to use it to give them tax breaks and this and that and the other because they may decide to hoard that stuff, right? It, uh, they, it may it or like this cash for clunk program, which is part of the stimulus. So what it means, you give people money to buy a car. Now, maybe they would have bought a car anyway. Which Some. Event, you're not doing yeah. any good at all. Some would have. But, but a lot of people, they're going to buy the car. Um, uh, they were planning to buy a car. And now, they'll, now they're being given money, so they'll buy it earlier. And then all you do is you move consumption up by a month. And in fact, what happened was uh, the program was in August and in September, a tremendous drop in purchases. And even if there are more purchases, you're purchasing from dealers' inventories. You don't get any production and hiring and, you know, until until they, they put in orders to the manufacturers to replace their inventories. If they have swollen inventories, it may take a very long time before the stimulus that causes people to buy the cars actually leads to rehiring some of the auto workers so it it's it's inefficient and if and if it and if most of it is going to be spent next year in 2010 when the economy is recovering then you have this very serious inflation problem so as i say the principle makes sense and if it had been and there were some stimulus efforts in the Depression uh, in the 30s, probably did a good job. Uh, Germany and Japan <laughs> recovered very quickly from the uh, de uh, Depression because they poured money into military uh, expand, you know, military stuff. Well, that, you know, that can be quite effective stimulus. You, uh, you have public spending, puts a lot of people to work, draft people, that's reduces unemployment. So it, it can work, these fiscal stimuluses, but um, but timing is critical, design of the program is critical, and I, I don't think we've done a, a good job. I want to ask you about the theory behind it, because I'm 
and to come back to the Germany and Japan example, we're taping this uh, early November 2009. As you point out, the stimulus plan was passed in February. It was a $787 billion plan. A grand total of $120 billion has been spent so far. Uh, the top parts of the government that for the spending of that money, two-thirds of it, of that 120 has been spent by the Department of Education, Labor, and Health and Human Services. Those are not shovel-ready projects. The Department of Transportation has spent all of $4 billion. Right. So it isn't surprising that a lot of construction workers are not finding their way back into the right. workforce. But, but I want to talk about the theory and come back to your Keynes article because there's a piece of this I've never understood. Uh, as you correctly pointed out and as John Taylor mentioned earlier has, has um, analyzed, back in uh, March or February of 2008 – uh, when George Bush was still president, he signed – and con Congress passed and he signed a set of tax rebates. They were $168 billion. Everyone concluded after that uh, episode they were too little. They were way too small. Uh, Market-oriented economists said they were too much – they were rebates rather than uh, changing incentives. But what Taylor and others have claimed, and I think correctly, is that much – and as you point out in your book, much of that was saved. Now, it was saved for all kinds of reasons. You could say it was saved for rational expectations reasons, a theory that's getting a lot of bad press these days. People anticipated future taxes. Or you could say it was saved for Keynesian reasons, animal spirits, people are nervous about the future and were hoarding, as, you, as you're suggesting in, in your remarks. What I don't understand is, is that if we spend $120 billion or $220 billion if, we, if the stimulus had been rolled out more quickly, the people who receive that money are going to have the same – incentive to be cautious about the future. And the so-called Keynesian multiplier isn't going to kick in any more via government spending than it would via the central bank pouring money into the economy. Can you have well, any ideas on that? that? I agree with that. So, so uh, the, the distinction um, that I would make is between transfer payments and, um, and investment. So, if the government just uh, borrows money and gives it to people, <laughs> um, whether it's in the form of a tax rebate or a tax credit or what have you, unemployment insurance benefits, health benefits, anything like that, then um, uh, people will, uh, they'll, they may save a great deal of it, especially if they think it's a one-time thing, because there's a... There's a fair amount of evidence. This is this is a, a very genuine contribution by Milton Friedman. There's a great deal of evidence that um, people tend to save what is called transitory income, windfalls, you know, non-recurring incomes. If if their permanent income increases, you know, they get a job promotion and so on, then they then they'll adjust their standard of living. They'll spend more. But if it's just a, a, a Let's say a windfall, unless it's gigantic, but if it's just a windfall, just, uh, you know, maybe you, you win a, a hundred dollars in a, in a casino or something, you, you just add it to, you know, you, you're likely to save it rather than, rather than try to adjust your standard of living just because you've had a little surge. So that, so the, and the part that's saved doesn't, doesn't do the economy any good. Now, the part that's spent, there's still a problem with what's spent because what's spent is going to be it's going to be mainly retail and you go into a store and you buy something now that doesn't lead directly to any more employment right you've bought something now maybe as i say it's what is about the cash for clunkers okay you you bought it from the store's inventory now maybe it'll replace it at some time but until it replaces it, there's not going to be any more employment. But the net, but but the other problem is that the the consumption expenditures that people make when they receive these windfalls that has absolutely no relation to do no relation to to the problems of the economy, right? Because because the problems are centered in particular industries like construction, very high level of of unemployment and construction and manufacturing. About half and, about and, half of the last jobs since right. December 2007 are in those two areas. Right. And of course it varies across states. Yep. But if I'm living in, you know, Seattle and I get this $250 check for the government and I go buy something, that's not going to do anything for construction. 
certainly for construction, probably would do nothing for manufacturing. So, so as I say, the, the idea was get people to work. Now, Roosevelt, at the beginning of the, uh, his administration, 1933, created these, you know, work, prog- work, uh, yeah, WPA. Progress Administration <laughs> yeah. and the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. Within months, they had hired literally millions of people. Now, to do, you know, some painting and cleaning the sidewalks and stuff like that, it wasn't it wasn't very productive. But you put all these people to work and gave them an income and so on, and, and that had a, a, that was a tremendous shot to the arm. But what we do now in the name of uh, fiscal stimulus is, is uh, very, very oblique and, and not as effective. Now, it probably did something, you know, this increase in uh, output in the third quarter is due in part, undoubtedly, and what part, no one knows, but due in some extent to the what you mentioned, $120 billion. Well, yeah, I, we've done a number of podcasts on the Great Depression, and interested listeners will put some links up to those. Uh, of course, the historical question of what role Roosevelt played, the war played in um, the recovery is still an open question, rather extraordinary. Uh, to me, that's as uh, – Yes, it is extraordinary. That we don't have a consensus. <laughs> Tells you how hard economics is or right. how bad economists are at it. Um, we're almost out of time. I'd, I'd like to hear you talk about – the rather extraordinary expansion of uh, discretion in the economy by uh, central government uh, in both – obviously in the banks, uh, obviously in all kinds of areas of the banks that had not been involved – the government had not been involved with before, the special master for executive compensation being an example, the um, role of the government in the auto industry, the continued role of the government in, in my opinion, distorting the housing industry. Um, what are your thoughts on where we're heading for the balance between government and what I would call centralized versus decentralized decision making? And do you think the Constitution has anything to say about it? Oh, I don't. I don't think the Constitution does because uh, because things have changed so much since the 18th century, and and really the Supreme Court has written a pretty blank check to the government. So uh, I wouldn't think the Constitution would come into well. You never know. There's a, a very conservative Supreme Court. Maybe they'll. But on the other hand, the Supreme Court in the 30s was so stung by the reaction to its efforts to curb the New Deal that probably the current Supreme Court will not want to take this on. But I do think that the there's a very very unhealthy shift going on in the line between government and business. I mean, it's really uh, really very serious. And um, uh, in particular, the uh, uh, actually acquiring, you know, operating control of General Motors by the government by taking a majority stock interest, I think, very unsound. Similarly, of course, they've taken over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and AIG. These are really government companies now. Yeah. And uh, they have essentially control Citigroup. I think I think the government owns like a third of Citigroup stock. And, um, you know, it's throwing its weight around with, with all of the uh, uh, large banks. And, of course, also this, you know, compensation stuff, which is a lot of nonsense. And what, and also enormous increase in government expenditures. Yep. Um, you know, take the, the health care business, trillion dollars, just an enormous expansion in government. And these deficits um, will lead either to uh, uh, very high taxes or, I think, more likely to uh, inflation or devaluation to try to wipe out the, uh, the national debt, which is, which is so enormous. What I, what I find worrisome about the current current government, and I don't think it's party thing, because we saw the deficit surge during the Bush administration, yep. is that um, the, the political system is uh, extremely hospitable to expansions in government and extremely reluctant to finance them. So uh, 
you know, we have this enormous borrowing, and uh, it's not clear it's uh, it's sustainable. I, you know, there's talk about, you know, the administration is serious about the deficit, and I'm sure there are people in it who are very serious. They have a lot of good people in it. But uh, there, there don't seem to be any actual concrete, realistic plans for doing anything <laughs> about the enormous uh, annual deficits and the enormous national debt that's growing uh, with these deficits. And, you know, if the national debt is entirely internal, if it's Americans borrowing from other Americans through the government, that's that's one thing. But uh, 45% of uh, the public part of the national debt, the important thing, $7.5 trillion, Half of that is owned by forty-five uh, percent is owned by foreigners. So we we're we're not only dependent on foreigners to finance our uh, government, but uh, we're paying enormous uh, interest costs every year to uh, foreign governments and other and foreign investors. That's just a drain of uh, American wealth, and it seems to be you know on track to continue growing until we finally. I mean, I don't suppose we default, <laughs> we could. but with inflation uh, or devaluation, obviously, we would we would greatly reduce the the uh, burden of the debt, but but you know, greatly weaken our standing internationally. The standing of the dollar is the international reserve currency, which is a, a very profitable uh, status for our economy to have all the foreigners <laughs> buying dollars to trade with each other. So, well, so it's very, it's, it might, it's very worrisome. But that might discipline future governments from uh, borrowing so extensively. There may be a silver lining there. Well, it, it depends what you think the, the political balance in the United States is. And if you have, you know, these very powerful interest groups like the elderly who are not... <laughs> Looking to the long term, they just want their benefits now, and and they have tremendous political power. And and the more the the costs of government are shoved off on the future, the less weight they have with the politicians who well, have such a limited horizon. I think your co-blogger Gary Becker would suggest that maybe some of the elderly care about their children. It might might mitigate some of it, maybe. Uh. I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. It's a good. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> I hope it's true. But my guest today has been Judge Richard Posner. Judge, thanks for being part of Econ yes, Talk. Well, it was really fun, and your questions were very challenging. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.